Hello, I'm William Lassiter, and I'll be taking you through an examination of this great work from the 15th century. This is Le Mort d'Arthur by Thomas Mallory, the story of King Arthur and the formation of the Round Table, how Arthur brought together, out of chaos, all these different knights, Gowan and Lancelot, and Bors, and Bedivere and Percival, and how he was able to achieve that great work of the finding of the grail, the paragon of human civilization. And then, of course, how, as all things do, the Camelot society fell apart and fell into civil war and eventually was lost to English society. When we look at this story of Camelot and of Arthur and these various knights and images, we find that we have a very rich work that has stood the test of time a work that has so embedded itself in the English imagination that it's one of two pillars that construct almost all the imagery that we see in later literature. On the one side, we have the pillar of the King James Version of the Bible, that great translation of the Christian work of art that gives the symbolism of Christ and of the Church and a revelation of the Old Testament. And then on the other hand, we have this great work, of the Arthurian cycle, a series of stories and sagas that were first oral tradition and were then later written down by various individuals, troubadours, writers such as uh, Chrétien de Troyes in France and, and other anonymous writers in British history, and then finally written down by Mallory himself in the 15th century. Between these two pillars, we have the imagery that constitutes almost all of British thought and British literature for many, many years afterwards. One of the first things to address is actually something which exists in our own culture, and I know will come up eventually, is reference to the famous comedy troupe of Monty Python. Anytime that I teach uh, Arthur, uh, students immediately say, are we going to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Well, no. Uh, I, I don't want to actually bring Monty Python in more than at this one point, but I do think it is necessary to address what they're doing in order to clear the air about the story that Mallory is going to be addressing. Monty Python was a group of very fine comedians and very funny, the material they produced, but they were basically a post-nuclear uh, comedy troupe. They were reacting to the inherent absurdity of the bomb, and consequently most of their comedy was in order to show the absurd nature of human life, especially in that Cold War era. So I'm not going to bring up Monty Python uh, at all, except for this one instance, to clear the air about it, that they are basically subverting this great and noble work. Now when we think about Mallory, we have to consider that Mallory is writing down a series of stories that had been around for some time prior to him. He was writing in the 15th century, the 1400s, and prior to that, we had had people that had told these stories based on a real historical character. Back when the Danes swept across England, after the Romans moved out, the Danes swept across England and they conquered the whole territory of England, and they imposed what was called the Dane Law. And the Danes were themselves pagans, they weren't Christians at all. And they drove the Christians, basically, westward into Wales. And the, the onslaught of the Danes was stopped by one man in particular, a Roman-trained soldier, Welshman, by the name of Arturus, and he was called Arturus the Great, Arturus Magnus, or Arturus Rex, Arturus the King. And Arthur the King stopped the Dane advance, and so he went down in history as this great man who was able to preserve Christian civilization against the onslaught of darkness that the Danes represented. Well, that story of Arthur went into popular legend, and he was associated with all these local legends and all these Welsh or Celtic legends that were existing for many, many generations prior even to him. And around that figure of Arthur came encrusted all these different stories, and we get stories that then show up in works like the Mabinogion, for instance, that show up in the story of the death of Arthur by the anonymous uh, writer, uh, oral tradition that shows up in the book of the Tain Bakul, um, or, uh, stories that even went over into France. And the French element under the troubadours uh, also gets attached to the Arthur courts. So you're, you're getting a number of different writers and authors that create stories that then get crusted together under that umbrella of the Camelot Arthur 
thing. Uh, one author in particular, Chrétien de Troyes, who was a French writer and troubadour, created this character of Lancelot. It just made him up and attached him to the court of Arthur as the lover of Guinevere. What Mallory does then is he takes all those different characters and stories and he weaves them together into one single work. And he does so in order to try and make a single point. And that's what makes this work so unique among all the various other numerous works about Arthur, is it doesn't just take disparate stories and throw them up haphazardly. He tries to weave these disparate stories together into a single point. Mallory himself is a very colorful character. He apparently fought uh, in the wars that were going on at the time, the, the struggle that was going on for the crown in the 1400s, and later after the war was a man who uh, was in jail several times, so something like four or five times he was thrown into jail for things like battery and theft. And so he wasn't a, a noble character himself or a man who was a, a very lily white of hue. And while he's in jail, he actually writes this work of La Morte d'Arthur. But it is striking to me how such a broken and hedonistic and uh, sinful man would write so profound a work about the nature of human existence. In some ways, it's his very trials that allow him to speak so eloquently about the suffering of human beings. He's a bit like the Johnny Cash of his day, if you will. Uh, he's a man who, in some ways, understood intimately failure and sin and the, 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 uh, the constant desire for greatness and knowing that you're shut out by your own sin from that greatness. So a bit like Johnny Cash, he hears that whistle blowing and he hangs his head and he cries. Um, he sees the nobility that other people exhibit and the saintliness and the holiness that other people exhibit. And in the work we get a sense that Mallory, in writing this, knew he could never do that. He could never access that nobility or he had a hard time accessing it. One way or the other, it's Mallory's uh, trials in prison and his trials with his own sinfulness and his disillusionment about nobility that he acquires after fighting in these wars that allow him then to make this tremendous work that shows not just saintly figures doing saintly things, but very broken men and women operating in a world of chaos and darkness and somehow in the midst of that chaos and darkness bringing something very noble and virtuous and rich out of that chaos. Lastly, I want to address something that Caxton himself says in his preface. One thing that we immediately think about in this work is that uh, it doesn't seem like history to us at all. It seems like a lot of fiction, a lot of mythology. But Caxton says specifically in his preface that those who think that there was no Arthur are exhibiting a certain foolishness. This is what he says. Diverse men hold opinion that there was no such Arthur and that all such books as been made of him, be feigned and fables, because that some chronicles make of him no mention, nor remember him nothing, nor of his knights. Whereto, they answered, and one in special said, that in him that should say or think that there was never such a king called Arthur, might well be arretted great folly and blindness. For he said that there were many evidences of the contrary. Wherefore it is a marvel why he is no more renowned in his own country, save only it accordeth to the word of God, which saith that no man is accepted for a prophet in his own country. He goes on in the preface to talk about this as a history, a history of King Arthur. And that was, that was pretty common. Most of the written forms of the Arthurian story talk about the history of Arthur, the history of the kings of England, or the history of the Grail, or the history of the fall of Camelot and the death of Arthur. So Mallory is writing a history in the sense that the medieval saw history. You see, one thing we have to consider is that we live in a post-enlightenment world. For us, history is a different thing. We think of history as empirical evidence, things we can prove or measure, back up by archaeology. And if there is no empirical evidence, if we can't measure it or if there was no written evidence of this, this isn't history, it's fiction. But the medievals didn't think that way, no more than the ancient world people did. Ancients, as well as the medievals, as well as pretty much everybody up until the Enlightenment, thought of history as myth. Myth and history were the same thing. The reason being is that for them, history only had bearing on people reading it in the present. 
That is, we read these histories not to know about people in the past, because they could care less in some ways, but rather to know about how we live right now. And the histories, as conceived prior to the Enlightenment, were works that were designed in order to show us how we ought to live our current lives. If they didn't have bearing on us in our current lives, they were kind of worthless. And to some degree, that's, that's a rather intriguing point. Of course, now we would not claim such things to be history. But why should we learn about, say, for instance, the Battle of 1066? How many men died, when it happened, what the m impact was? Why should we learn about those things? Unless, of course, they have bearing on how we should live now. If, for instance, we're learning about the greatness of men and, and the nobility of people and how they would bleed and die for something, or the strength or the strategy, then we're learning something not about people long dead, but about ourselves and what humans are capable about right now. And in that sense, I think that Caxton is very correct. There was an Arthur, even if he was a mythological figure. There was a character in history that did these things, and that consequently now when we look at our current situation, that is the 15th century for Caxton, we can say we too can live our lives this way, and we too can bring greatness out of darkness. And if nothing else, this vision of history and mythology is one gives us a sense that we are living not just in one thing after another, as the post-Enlightenment history seems to indicate, but rather that we, too, are living in a tremendous story, a story that unfolds even as we speak, that our lives are not just puny, mundane machines within an ongoing machine, but rather that our lives, like Arthur's and like Lancelot's and Guinevere's, are part of a great drama, a great pageant, a great story that takes place on the stage of this world.